my mother always told me from when I was really small, she consistently told me, she was like, you have to work three times harder yeah. to be seen as equal. Rebecca, Hi. thank you for coming and sitting with me and having and have a nice little chat. I was going to do the whole intro, but I feel like it would be best coming from yourself. Yeah. And don't be shy, don't be modest, because I've. I, if you leave anything out, I'm yeah. going to be like, actually, he forgot to tell you that he's done this, 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 this. this. So go ahead, tell, tell the people. Okay. <laughs> so my name is Shabaka Hutchings. I okay. play in three groups, right. um, which are Sons of Kemet. The Comet is Coming, and Shabaka and the Ancestors. Right. And um, that last group is a collaboration between myself and musicians from South Africa, from right. Johannesburg. Mm -hmm. But the first two are London-based. Okay. Um, I play the saxophone and clarinet. Wow. Um, I was classically trained, but, you know, like, I play all types of music. I've just played in many, many different mm -hmm. formations. Um, I do a lot of composing. I compose for Santa Kemet and the Ancestors, um, and just do loads of stuff. You know. How? Oh, wait a minute. So you've got you're you're in three groups. Three okay. groups, yeah. All at the same time. Um, we kind of go in touring cycles. So in right. general, we'll have an album, and then that group will take the precedent for a year and do lots and lots of gigs. So we've, we've just toured most of the, f the kind of major festivals around Europe um, and toured the world quite a lot. And then we'll be making an album for the other group while one group is touring. Oh so then gosh. the next year we'll tour with the, with the other band with a new album. I know this is a bit controversial, but what's your favourite? <laughs> they, they all just become the same thing yeah. after, you know. Everyone's literally been saying that. So anyone that play, who plays more than one instrument, I was like, what's your favourite instrument? And they're like, oh, you know, it's like a child, isn't it? Yeah. The mum can never say who the favourite child is. Exactly. And they, they go in cycles. All so right. some came up might be my favourite for certain reasons. Right, okay, um, right. And then the comment might be good for, for other ones. So you're a really established jazz artist. Uh, you, what were you going to say? I was going to say... I guess so. It feels like there I'm, um, go, I'm learning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but it really, it feels like I'm learning what, how to be comfortable with what I do. You know, well, that's the, the, well, the challenge. What do you mean? I think they're, they're players that identify with certain elements of jazz right, okay. um, more than I do. Okay. My whole career has been a battle to come to terms with my own, my own style. Right, you okay. know, and it might be that when I started out, I was doing my thing, but felt like I was inadequate in some aspects. Right. Um, and now at this stage, those inadequacies are actually strengths. Right. Because I've learned that, you know, you can only do what you do. Right. And if you do that to the best of your ability, then you'll be free to actually not have self-doubt about other things. Is it because your style of jazz doesn't necessarily fit the norm? I guess now it kind of does, it's, you okay, know, right. but at the time when I was studying, mm -hmm. the, the general paradigm was that you try to emulate America as right. much as possible. And one of the big stages in my development was realizing that, you know, I've learned a lot from the American style called jazz, yes. but I am from the Caribbean. And because I'm from the Caribbean, it means that, you know, there is that link to Africa. Right. So these are the two roots that I want to emphasize in my music, you know, Africa and the Caribbean. Yes. Um, and with the kind of jazz um, history that I've come up with. I think it's interesting that you mentioned America mm. because representation is obviously really important, but we, like you were saying, you had to look to America kind of to get the gist of jazz or what jazz was or look for your role models. Mm. Do you feel like the UK is getting better now at having our own role models so that the younger generation can kind of maybe look up to people like you or other people to think, okay, this is what jazz can be also? Yeah, definitely. I mean, when I was younger, and this includes when I was in Barbados, even though I might have been jamming bits of jazz, yes. I wouldn't call myself a jazz fan. I would have actually said I didn't like jazz. Right, okay. um, if someone were to say the word jazz to me, what came into my head were older, richer, whiter people. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the image I had of, of the music. Yeah. Um, because I hadn't really encountered it, in a, a situation that, that looked like me, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. or that kind of felt like the kind of thing that I was into. When I moved to England, one of the first people that I met, literally, was Soretto Kinch. Right, yeah. um, I met him backstage at a Courtney Pine concert. Mm -hmm. um, Courtney Pine gave me his number and said, call me anytime, I'll, you know, I'll discuss stuff with you, you know, wow. about music. <laughs> Soretto was doing a jam session once a week, and he just said, come down every week. And I went every week for about three years. Wow. Um, I'd go to his house and practice with him, We'd hang out, we'd talk about music. 
And it's that experience of actually encountering the music in an environment that made me feel welcome and right. that I could see, you know, this is something that I could do. This, this is a viable option, yeah. you know, for someone like me. That really helped, you know. Is that normal, though, that you get those opportunities or was, do you feel like you was maybe lucky that you was able to have those people around you to help you? Because some of the other guests that I've spoken to, they've said, you know, they didn't have that environment or it was it was difficult for them because the spaces that they were operating in, they didn't really see, you know, people like themselves. So do you feel like yours is kind of like a isolated situation mm. or, or no? I think that they've been, it's like there's been, there's a constant development of of that representation. So mm. for instance, Gary Crosby and Tomorrow's Warriors mm. has been trying to get that representation of black people doing jazz music and young black people um, seeing their peers mm. and actually elder musicians who are like them yeah. represented on stage. He's been doing that for the last 15 to 20 years. But still, it's like he's only, they're only now starting to see the fruits of all of that. Yeah. Um, and many musicians have come up with that being one of the only sources of representation on an institutional level that mm -hmm. was around. My situation in terms of having very close mentors at that age is um, unusual. And in some ways it's like, if you're looking at situations that are communal, as in underrepresentation is a systemic problem. Yeah. Um, it doesn't make sense to really look at it on an individual level because I had a certain experience on as an individual. Right. But if you're looking at me as a part of a broader group, then there is an underrepresentation of mm. black people within the music industry and within that um, access to jazz, which is changing now. And that's one of the great things about the time that we're in. Now you can see black women excelling at jazz. You can yeah. see um, black people on all aspects of the music industry. Um, it's not enough, yeah. but it's definitely, you can see that, that progression forward. You know? Do you think social media has a lot a part to play in that? Because now people can just obviously put out their music as of when they want to. They can build their own following. They don't have to wait for you know, the record labels to kind of invest in them. They can build their own brand. Do you, get, do you think social media has helped with that? Definitely, yeah. yeah. I mean, social media, it takes away an aspect of gatekeeping, right, yeah. which is that you can be visible, you can have an aspect, an element of visibility without having to either pay money for a publicist yeah. or just have someone say, we decide that you are the person. Right, and right, that right. will still be going on, but it means that there are routes and access points outside of the industry. Right. So you went to um, Guildhall School of Music and Drama. Yeah. I auditioned to go to Guildhall. I didn't get in, so you must be really good because... <laughs> I, and uh, talking about the, the environment, I know that there's not a lot of black people in those spaces. Yeah. I, in fact, when I was auditioning for that, I, I think I, it was like I read a quota or something called Stats, and it was like one black person like per year or something ridiculous yeah, like yeah. that there's hardly no black people in those environments i yeah. tried for all the drama schools like rada all of those and it's so difficult to get in um what was that time like th being there well for one there was yeah very little black yeah, people yeah um i think maybe in the four years that i was there on the music course there might have been about five or six wow. for the whole four years and mm. there was maybe about the same amount on the drama on the drama course mm -mm. And it's just one of those things where, you know, you just gotta you just gotta keep beating down, knocking at the knocking at the door, or actually looking at what's happening in terms of the the entrance requirements. Right. Uh, for me, it's like situations like this have to go back to the school. Like how what's happening at that high school level that's meaning that black um, students are not applying. Either they're not applying or they're applying and not getting in. Yeah. So it needs to really be kind of looked at in a, in a deep way mm. about both of those possibilities. Mm -hmm. Either why are they not applying yeah. or why are they applying but not getting in, you know, proportionate to how, you know, how many we are. So what's the curriculum like? Is it very old school still? Is it still what you're, the people that they're educating you about? Are they, were, were there black people that they educated you about? Or was it predominantly like white musicians? How was that? Mm. And how did that affect how you started to, you know, make music? Um, well, I did the classical course on okay, clarinet. That, yeah. Um, and I did it because at the time I was playing a lot of clarinet and right. I wanted to just understand the history of that instrument. Right. Um, and I remember talking to Courtney Pine about it. And mm -hmm. he says, because I could have done the jazz course or the classical course. And he was saying, you want to get the course that has the longest tradition of teaching that instrument, right? Okay. Um, as opposed to going for the jazz course but studying the clarinet on it. 
So, I mean, it, you know, if you're going to do the classical course, it's doing a course in Western classical music. Mm -hmm. So there are going to be, you know, no black people that you come into contact with. That's not to say that black people haven't been a part of that right. music tradition. But on the course, it is pretty old school in that you don't get representation um, of black composers or black instrumentalists. Um, but that's not what I was looking for for me. Um, I was doing that research on my own time. Right. Um, and that's not to say that it shouldn't be a part of the course. Yeah. Um, but I, I didn't expect any better from them. Mm. You know, I went in thinking that this is the seat of the training of, for European culture. So that's what I'm going to get. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I see my role within that institution of assimilation. Like, let's see what you've got to offer me and then I'll take it and I'll add to it my own research. And mm -hmm. my research is research of Africa and the Caribbean and the uh, aesthetics that govern, you know, those musical, you know, experiences. Right. You know? So you've, you've just finished recording the album, right? Yeah. Well, we, we recorded an album just before the first lockdown. Okay. That's about to come out in May. Right, And nice. that's an album with Sons of Kemet. Nice, um, okay. Which I'm really excited about. I think it's one of my favourite things that I've brought out, you know, just because I've had so much time to mm -hmm. actually digest and craft it over yeah. the last year. Um, and then we're, we're mixing the new Comets Coming album. That should be out next year. And uh, how's it been during, like, lockdown, not being able to tour and stuff? And how, does that affect the way you make your music? Because I'm guessing getting to see the world, that influences you and your touring and whatnot. So how's that been for you, for you lockdown and all this? Did... You, there's, a, there's a simple answer and a complex answer. We I'll want give you the complex. The complex answer. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> there's always different ways of looking at things, you right. know. And for me, it's, it's it's always a matter of perspective. Do you, are you looking at it from an optimistic perspective or a pessimistic perspective? Right. And in a situation like what happened last year, for me, it's all about the optimism. You just got to see what was good about the situation. And what was good about it for me was that I got a chance to really reflect on mm. who I was as an artist and yeah. what I need to do to progress. I was on the road so much, like really we did, the, in 2019, we did about 130 gigs in 10 months, oh my which gosh. is approximately a gig every three days. But in general, they were clumped together, so it was just gig, 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 mm. like we were touring like crazy, like really, we were on the road in an old school way. And the year before it was the same thing, and the year before it was the same thing. So by the stage that the, the lockdown came, I'm just like, I was never going to have this chance to actually right, just sit back and not chill, but rejuvenate. Mm -hmm. um, and I've realized through that process of um, creating during the lockdown that rejuvenation is different from inertia. Right. Like for me, rejuvenation isn't sitting still and not doing anything. Rejuvenation is just being in a position where I can actually reflect on how I go forward. Right. And once I've got that flow, then it's all good. Um, but it's scary. I, I'm not saying this as if it was an easy process. Yeah. Um, it was a process in, the, in terms of the lockdown and finding my creative balance. It was a process of realizing what I need to give up yeah. in terms of my kind of artistic practices and what I need to include that, you know, differently. Mm -hmm. It's an all the learning process. I think I've come out of it a more balanced musician and I've been learning like new technologies and ways of making music right. um, and elements of recording myself um, that I had had no time to do when I was on the road. How difficult or how many challenges have you faced as a, as a black musician? It's a tough one that my mother always told me from when I was really small, she consistently told me, she was like, you have to work three times harder yeah. to be seen as equal. And that's something that I've taken um, through my life as a, as a, as a, fix, as a fixture, mm. like you have to work harder. Like, you, you've got to do that. So there have been, like, for instance, with Guildhall, because of the lack of black people getting in, I'm sure that if you're equal, it, you're not equal. You right. know what I mean? I'm sure that if you give a, a similar performance to someone else, that it's, it's not equal to the same, it, it doesn't equate to the same leverage in terms of getting into the college. But that just means you've got to practice harder than, than everybody else. Mm. Um, in terms of outright discrimination, I've not experienced a lot of it like to my face. Right. In terms of microaggressions, um, yeah. But for me, it's, I, I try to see things from an optimistic perspective. I try to see things as reasons why I need to work harder. And yeah, that's, that's the main thing I, I take from it. I, there's not a lot of instances that are coming into my head yeah, where right. I feel defeated by 
discrimination, where right. I feel like there's been discrimination that hasn't caused me to, to try to push harder. And maybe that's a self-defense mechanism. Yeah. Um, because despair is the most crippling. Mm. Like despair, if you think that there's a situation that you've been placed in where you can't learn and you can't go forward. Yeah. And so I try to turn any situation of um, discrimination or lack of, of understanding as an impetus for trying to push forward and, and, and just better myself. You mentioned before about your roots, about, you know, Barbados and then Caribbean and then linking it back to Africa. How important is it for that to come through in your in your music? Because I was talking to some a couple of the guests before and they were saying, you know, sometimes as black people, it's really difficult to kind of balance, you know, talking about things that affect us as black people, but then just also maybe talking about how water is blue and not, right. you know, not having to, you know, talk about maybe the struggles or the traumas or the stuff that we've been through. How important is it to you? And do you, do you find it hard to find a balance? Um, yeah, I think it, it is difficult finding the balance, but I've learned that I... I just, as an artist, I need to just reflect what I'm going through. Right, yeah. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm going through as in what I'm dealing with mm. on a ideas level. And I'm really interested in black history. Yeah. And I'm interested in what has, what, what's made my, what, what, what my makeup is. Mm -hmm. Like what are the elements that have resulted in me being where I am. Right. Which means that you kind of analyze yourself and then go back you know, go back and back and back. So I put that out in my music. Mm. Um, but that's just me. It doesn't, you know, and that's where I'm at in my life. It might be that in five years' time, I don't feel like doing that. Right, yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's, necess it's necessary to wear your identity on your sleeve, but I think it's necessary to have an integrity and put forward what you're dealing with. Right. And to be, and just to be curious and, yeah, searching mm. about it. You know, like, it's, it's worth reflecting on your identity mm. you know because if you don't reflect on your identity you know nobody will True. and it might be that it's, it's not that we're in neutral bubbles culturally yeah. like there are you know we're in a situation where there are cultural hegemonic forces that are, are pushing um, obviously I saw that early in my life with the hegemonic force of America trying dominating the space of what I thought was the pinnacle of music um, and we see this in, you know, time and time again. So for me, it's like you've got to really have a strong foundation of who you are mm. if you're going to actually dictate the culture that you're a part of. You yeah, know, because yeah, culture yeah. isn't just something that stands separate to people. Culture right. is something that people, the musicians and the artists, um, give meaning to. Mm. So that meaning's only going to be fluid and it's only going to be vibrant if we're constantly trying to um, search for, like, what what we are representing, right, yeah. you know, because the, for me, the, the, the travesty is to get an idea of oneself and to keep it, you mm. know, to keep it kind of um, doggedly for years and years, like I am black, I am black and black is this and that, mm. you know, whereas things change, you know, that's one of the, the, the few things that you can say is a constant in nature yeah. and in, in everything, in the yeah. way the world functions. It's like change is a fact of life. Yeah. So, if you're going to identify something, it's got to be something that has changed as a part of that basic mm. makeup. So, you know, a lot of the ways that I structure my, my artistic processes are based on, like, search and inquiry into who, who I am, who I imagine I am. Right. Um, so our last album with Sons of Kemet is called Your Queen is a Reptile. Each track um, title is, is a, a kind of homage to different women throughout history. So you might have a track called My Queen is Angela Davis or My Queen is Harriet Tubman or My Queen is Doreen Lawrence, for right, instance. Okay. And the idea behind that was trying to ask how do we pick our leaders, you know? Because it, it's not just saying, oh, you know, the monarchy has a, a tail and a, and a forked tongue. Mm. It's just saying the, the monarchy is a construct that can be disassembled. It right. can be mocked, it can be mimicked, or it can be revered and praised. If we choose to not give it reference and if we choose to put someone else on that pedestal mm. even if it's just on an ideological level how do we make those choices you know how why do you choose angela davis why do you choose harriet tubman yeah. and what um, principles um do they have 
that you look up to. Yeah. And then it's about looking at how do you take those principles and then apply it mm -hmm. to the people that are supposed to be in charge. Right. And if they fall short, then what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's just about, you know, questioning and, and a constant learning about what, how things are made up around you. So you've got an album coming out in May. Yeah. And you're finishing up the other album or you're finishing up the other album that you just... You said? We're kind of, yeah, mixing the, right, the album that's going to come out next year. Okay. But we've got an album that's ready to go in May. May, okay. Yeah. And um, what's the, can you tell us what it's called? Can't tell you what it's called yet. Oh, God, I'm trying to always get the drops. No one wants to give me the drops. <laughs> I'm trying to get the, 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 exclusive, the, exclu yeah. the exclusive information. Okay. Um, so tell the people where they can find you. Are you on, you should be on social. I'll be surprised if you're not on socials. Yeah, yeah, I'm so oh, so I, I know, I don't know, you sometimes you give me this, like, vibe of mysteriousness you know like you're there but you're not really there like do, do you get that do you I, get, I do get yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. see that. see that vibe of like i'm not on socials you just have to find my music and if you can find it <laughs> you and if you can't that's right bad luck yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, so i'm on socials but i don't follow anyone so I, i'm not oh, like see, i don't hang out the, there oh one of those yeah, people. yeah I'm, that, I'm that guy so let the people know where they can find you um so i'm on instagram most of my stuff i put on instagram and i'm I see my Instagram page as a document of what, I, what I'm up to. Right, like, okay. I'm an archiver. Okay. So I kind of give, if you follow my Instagram page, you'll just see what my life is, you okay. know. Like, anything I do to do with my kind of artistic life, I'll do, do a little kind of picture or a, a video or something mm -hmm. to say to, to the audience, but all, mainly to myself, right. this is what I did on this day. Cool. Um, I'm also on Facebook, I've got an artist page, and on, on Twitter. So my Instagram is Shabaka Hutchings, okay. and it's basically that for everything else. Um, on Twitter, I think it's Shabaka with an H, so, so Shabaka. Do you, follow, you do, that, do you not follow anyone on Twitter then? Don't follow anyone on anything. Oh, wow. I mean, I'd love to do that on Twitter, because Twitter is just... Yeah. Don't follow anyone on Twitter. <laughs> don't do it to yourself. Um, but thank you so much. Oh, thank you. So guys, um, thank you for watching. And as we've mentioned in this discussion, we need you to take part in this survey so we can understand what's happening so that a change can be made. So guys, what we need you to do is we need you to head over to blim.org.uk forward slash change and you can anonymously fill out the survey and we need you to do this so that we can actually make a change. Bye. At the moment, there is no data on the experiences of black musicians and professionals within the UK music industry. Let your voice be heard by filling out the survey. You can do this by going to blim.org.uk forward slash change.